live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Perhaps one of the best feelings in the world is to get revenge on your former team and former coach, especially when you felt they did you dirty. It's one thing if you left your original team on good terms and it was just a natural end of the road, or it just wasn't working out anymore. But when your coach uses you as a scapegoat for the entire time that you're here, and is consistently finding the largest bus to throw you under, and you finally get out of that situation and are able to stick it to him, that's gotta feel good. That has all the makings of a fantastic revenge game. And here is one of those that you might not have heard of before, but absolutely qualifies as one of the sweetest revenge games to ever take place in the National Football League. This is Buffalo Bills fullback Larry Kennebrew. He started off as a member of the Cincinnati Bengals, and let's just say that he and head coach Sam Weish did not get along with each other in the slightest bit. When Kennebrew finally got a chance to go up against Weish and show him that everything he said about Kennebrew was wrong, Kennebrew made the most of that opportunity, bulldozing through Weish's defense in a winning effort. And this is the story behind the great revenge game of Larry Kennebrew. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand just who Larry Kennebrew is, why he was on the Bills, and why he hated Sam Weish in the first place. In the sixth round of the 1983 NFL Draft, the Bengals drafted the Tennessee State running back. Cincinnati didn't have a super strong or deep running game, as outside of Pete Johnson, the Bengals didn't have any threats, as they finished in the bottom half of the league in rushing yards and yards per carry during that 1982 season. While Canterbury wouldn't get a whole lot of playing time as a rookie, once Pete Johnson was no longer on the team by 1984, Canterbury's playing time would increase significantly, and he would actually become a pretty instrumental part of that offense. As a side note, if you want to learn more about Pete Johnson and his departure from the Bengals, which allowed Canterbury to have an increased role with the team, then click the card in the upper right corner. In 1984, Canterbury had 623 rushing yards, which was the most of anyone on the team, and he had 9 rushing touchdowns alongside that which was not only the most on the team, but it also accounted for 50% of the team's total rushing touchdowns that season. For some more perspective on how valuable he was, no other player on the Bengals had more than two rushing touchdowns in 1984. Kennebrew had nine, and ranked inside the top 10 in the NFL in this category. If you needed a short yardage bulldozer during the mid-80s, there were few men in football more productive than he was. He finished inside the top 10 in touchdowns once again in 1985 with nine, inside the top 10 again in 1986 with eight touchdowns, and finished third during the strike short in 1987 season with eight touchdowns. When you're a sixth round pick and you score 34 rushing touchdowns in a four year stretch, ranking inside the top 10 of the NFL in all four of these years, that is incredible. And for some more perspective on just how good Canterbury was for Cincinnati, he was one of just five players between 1984 to 87 to score at least 34 rushing touchdowns. On top of that, the complete list of players to finish inside the top 10 of the NFL in rushing touchdowns in every season from 1984 to 87 consists of eventual Hall of Famer Eric Dickerson and Larry Kennebrew. That's it. Anytime you're in an exclusive list where the only other person on it is Eric Dickerson, that should give you an idea of just how good Kennebrew was. Yet despite his seemingly strong play in Cincinnati, he found himself in the doghouse of Sam Weish quite regularly. When the Bengals drafted Kennebrew in 1983, Sam Weish was not there. He was the head coach in Indiana, as Forrest Gregg was still the man in charge. This meant that Weish didn't really have any attachment to Kennebrew. He still played him at fullback, and Kennebrew would play well, but it seemed at times like Weish was playing him because he had to, and not because he wanted to. The trouble started one year after Weish got there, as in 1985, he put Kennebrew on blast for his weight. Keep in mind that Kennebrew was playing well, and his weight was a strength to his game. He had a game against the St. Louis Cardinals where he had 5 yards per carry, and after the game, Cardinals linebacker EJ Jr., who was a Pro Bowler and first team All-Pro the year before, said, tell me. How does one stop an earth-moving vehicle? Yet, Weish put Kennebrew on blast throughout that 1985 season and throughout seemingly his entire career in Cincinnati for his weight. As Weish said on the largest fullback in the league, excluding William Perry in Chicago, when he's 260 or 265 pounds, he's a big man. When he's 270 or 275, he's a big man who's got a little fat on him. When he gets to 280, he becomes a fat man. Not sure you ever want to hear your head coach calling you fat in the midst of a really good season when you're the equivalent of a human battering ram. These criticisms by Weish never stop, and in 1987, the relationship reached its breaking point at one of the weirdest possible times. You don't really expect the relationship to just completely fall apart after a win against the Atlanta Falcons, especially a win where Kennebrew rushed for 100 yards and scored the game-winning touchdown with one minute left. But a few days after that game, Weish put Kennebrew in the doghouse and benched him, because Kennebrew had to leave practice due to a bad case of strep throat. Not only did Weish blame Kennebrew for being sick, but he fined him $600. By this point, Kennebrew was done, and lashed out at the media, saying every year, he makes me the scapegoat for something. 
and I guess I'm the scapegoat again now. Kinnebrew, after having 100 yards against the Falcons, touched the ball one time against the Steelers the following week. Despite Kinnebrew's strong production in Cincinnati, especially for a six-round pick who wasn't really expected to do a whole lot, his time with the Bengals had seemingly reached the point of no return. Entering the 1988 season, Kinnebrew was holding out for a new contract. As you can probably guess, he did not get this contract, and was released from the team toward the end of training camp. Assistant General Manager Mike Brown said on the holdout, I don't think he went about it in a very intelligent fashion. Which is super odd that a super generous and willing to spend owner like Mike Brown thought that a player wanting more money was stupid. The Bengals went on to make it to the Super Bowl that season, and Kennebrew was not a part of that squad, as he sat out for the entire season. However, when 1989 rolled around, the Buffalo Bills signed the former Bengals fullback. If the ball wasn't going to Thurman Thomas, it was going to Kennebrew. And over the first half of the season, Kennebrew was, for the most part, picking up right where he left off from a production standpoint. Through his first 10 games of the season, he had 306 yards on slightly under 4 yards per carry and 5 rushing touchdowns. His average over that 4-year peak in Cincinnati was 606 yards, 8 touchdowns, and 4 yards per carry. At the midway point of the 1989 season, he was on pace for 490 yards, 8 touchdowns, and around 4 yards per carry. So he was right in line with what he was doing during the mid-80s. The next game, though, was the game that he had been circling on his calendar from the moment he signed with Buffalo. It was the rematch against Cincinnati. Kennebrew was going to be facing Sam Weish in a competitive game for the first time, and after Weish seemingly wronged Kennebrew for all those years, this was Kennebrew's chance at payback. And Kennebrew made it very clear that he had something to prove. He said, I've been working hard to get ready for this game. I'm looking forward to playing against them on my own turf. He also criticized Weish for being a hypocrite, saying, when we lost, my weight was a problem. When we won, it wasn't. Kennebrew was tired of being the scapegoat, and now was ready to show Weish what he had been missing out on. Safe to say, he did just that. November 26, 1989. It's week 12 of the NFL season, and the Bengals are traveling out east to Buffalo to take on the Bills in this critical AFC showdown. There were so many storylines entering this game that I would be here all day if I listed every single one of them. You have the fact that this was the rematch of last year's AFC Championship, and I talked a bit about that game in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. You have the fact that Buffalo was tied for the lead in the AFC East with Miami at 7-4, and Cincinnati was a half game out of the wild card with a 6-5 record. And you had the revenge factor between Kennebrew and his former team, since the two sides did not end on great terms. The good news for Buffalo is that they won this game, and they did so rather convincingly. Safe to say, they took out their frustration on the Bengals, eliminating them from the playoffs the year before. Buffalo led it 10-0 at the half, scoring the first 17 points of the game, and wound up winning it by a final score of 24-7, with Jim Kelly throwing three touchdown passes. The defense played lights out, forcing three turnovers and holding Cincinnati to just 25 minutes of possession and a mere 133 net passing yards, with Boomer Esiason completing just 42% of his passes and posting a pass rating of 43.1. But what about Kennebrew? How did he perform? Well, he was a man on a mission, and I think it's safe to say that during this game, that mission was accomplished. Buffalo got him heavily involved in the offense, and he did not disappoint, running 15 times for 66 yards on 4.4 yards per carry, showing off loose boulders or S qualities at times. It was a drastic improvement over the previous week, when he only had 10 yards on 2 yards per carry in a loss to the New England Patriots. To be fair, Cincinnati's run defense was notoriously bad in 1989, and it might have been the main reason why despite their incredibly talented offense and pass defense, that they missed the postseason. They finished third last in rushing yards allowed and dead last in yards per carry allowed. However, Canterbury took advantage of this, and made the most of exploiting this weakness. When the final whistle sounded on that Sunday afternoon, it was clear that Larry Kennebrew got his revenge. What was somewhat bizarre about this game is that after getting his revenge on the Bengals and Sam Weish, he didn't really do anything of note after that. Kennebrew struggled after that game. Over his next three games, he failed to find the end zone, and picked up just 70 rushing yards on 3.3 yards per carry. He played in Buffalo's playoff game against the Cleveland Browns, and in that 34-30 loss, only managed 17 rushing yards on 7 carries. And when 1990 rolled around, Kennebrew had 9 rushing attempts for 18 yards or an average of 2 yards per carry. He never played in the NFL again after that 1990 season, meaning that the game that he had against Cincinnati was one of the last great moments of his career. And what I find really fascinating about this situation is just how quickly his mindset changed as the game was approaching versus the start of the season when the Bengals played the Bills in the preseason. Prior to that game, Canterbury took the high road. He said that even though he had his differences with Weish, that he never had bad feelings toward him, and that he wasn't out there to try and show him that he made a mistake, saying, that's not for me. But three months later, when they actually met at a game that mattered, it was a complete 180, almost as if he didn't have to keep his feelings bottled up anymore. 
he had a mission to prove. And safe to say, he definitely proved it. Larry Kennebrew is one of the more underrated runners of the 1980s, partly because he never made a Pro Bowl or won any accolades, and partly because he got overshadowed by lots of other memorable Bengals runners from the 80s, including James Brooks and Icky Woods. However, he had quite the career. When you leave the game of football with 47 touchdowns to your name, you deserve to be celebrated. But perhaps the best moment of Kennebrew's career wasn't any one of those 47 touchdowns. Perhaps it was that quasi-finale of his in 1989, when after years of being the punching bag in Cincinnati under Sam Weish, he was finally the one who got to do the punching. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.